Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Alan Sherman. Um, this is the kickoff of the biweekly cyber defense meetings for spring 2001 from UMBC. Uh, today, it's an honor to have uh, two of our own, uh, Cyrus Boniati and Enes Goloshevsky, present results from the recent um, January winter research study by SFS and CYSP students um, who analyzed the security of an incident management system used at UMBC. Um, we'll be meeting in this room um, bi-weekly, Fridays at 12, and I've posted the a schedule of talks for the entire spring in the chat. Let me also um, remind everybody that we we'll offer a variety of scholarships in cybersecurity, including cyber scholars, uh, SFS, CYSP, and there's also one uh, for people in the ROTC program. Um, we have two application deadlines coming up. Um, February 7th uh, is the application deadline for uh, DOD CYSP, and February 15th um, is the deadline for um, SFS. Um, normally, um, we um, have one SFS application deadline, November 15th, but if we don't fill all the slots, then we will hold one or two additional rounds, and that's what's happening this spring. Um, for SFS, we're going to uh, seek to fill one more position. Um, the ROTC program is not connected with SFS nor CYSP. Um, it's um, a separate thing, and for more information, contact Dr. Marion. Um, for the SFS and CYSP programs, you apply through Scholarship Retriever, and details are given on the uh, scholarship section of the Cybersecurity Center page. I'll put the URL in the chat window. Um, we're recording, um, and, and we'll post this um, recording on the Cybersecurity Center uh, pages as we did for the um, uh, fall talks uh, for the ones which were permitted to be recorded. Um, so um, without further ado, um, uh, why don't we get going and I'll hand over the meeting to um, Annis and Cyrus. Thank you very much for that intro. And um... Ennis, are you able to hear me? Slash I'm back? not only able to hear you, I'm also able to see you. That is good, I think, probably. Uh, let me get into presenter view on this. You are slightly quiet, though, Cyrus, if you can increase your Zoom volume somehow. Oh, we're not on the Zoom, we're on WebEx. that help at all let's say yes oh okay sounds good i appreciate the lie oh that definitely helped oh, okay um let me make sure i'm sharing the proper thing okay can that be seen properly right now or okay perfect all right um this is uncomfortable i can see so you guys just want to make sure you're seeing the the slide deck and not the presenter view. There's a gray square blocking the uh, the slide deck in the upper right hand. There we go. How's that? Better. Perfect. Thank you very much. Sorry for the uh, delay on that. Actually, can I full screen it? That's better. Is that better? Yeah, actually, it's flawless. Perfect. All right. Thank you for bearing with me on that. Uh, so Ennis and I will be presenting the spring tw or the winter 2021 SFS research study uh, conducted by the SFS cohort, one of those scholarship programs that Dr. Sherman mentioned. And there were members in our study who were not necessarily in that scholarship, though um, there should not have been anyone who was part of the scholarship who was not part of the study. So uh, give you guys an overview as I like to do before any presentation. Um, we'll be giving a, a history of the SFS studies, 
Then I'll pass it off to Ennis to give an overview of the system we studied this year, some industry-wide statistics, and the parameters of uh, how we ran this study this year. Then uh, we will split the vulnerabilities, and uh, then we will split the conclusion a little bit where Ennis will take the good stuff and I will take the bad stuff. And then we'll have some room for questions at the end, and hopefully there's something you guys have to ask. Um, Ennis, while you're on presenter duty, I will try to monitor the text questions if you can do the same for me uh, in, in the meantime. Sure. All right. Sounds good. So as I've said before, this is a regular event for us. Uh, every spring, we do these studies of some system at UMBC, normally part of DOIT, and I don't think ever not at this point. Uh, so the first year was NetAdmin, which was a firewall monitoring and control system. Uh, the second year was WebAdmin, which is something that you is publicly accessible to any UMBC student. Uh, the third one was VertHost, which was a uh, website hosting solution. And the fourth one was SAMS, which was a, a scholarship administration uh, management service. I'm not sure if that's exactly what it stood for, but essentially it managed um, funds and the allocation of funds and was part of the operational procedure by which you could take grant money in, I believe, the chemistry department and make requests for what to spend it on. This year, of course, was IMS, so that one's not on this list because this is a historical timeline. Uh, our success rate on these studies, uh, because we are trying to pen test them and assess whether they are secure enough for any deployment, uh, has been pretty good on our success rate and a little lackluster on the success rate of the the system we are attacking um, we have made we have, the first year we got control of umbc firewall um, in three of the years including this year spoiler alerts we've gotten service root um, and in 2019 we got system root as well which was a, a good improvement and kerberos tickets can be used with ldap to spread your reach a little further and impersonate some students as well, or staff members, which is vulnerable to the entire UMBC infrastructure. So those were our two good years and the other years have been successful in um, breaking the system itself, but not necessarily, or the service itself, but not necessarily the system as a whole. And that, that by large is, uh, as you'll find out, at least this year due to the reliance on third party systems and open source software, uh, which helps mitigate the ability to break into an entire system when you don't write it all in house, of course. Uh, we find that the typical vulnerabilities, the most frequent have been SQL injection, but this year we have a pretty interesting attack, uh, set of attacks that got us into service route. Uh, the others, of course, directory traversal, um, improper configuration of an Apache stack, um, and of course, unsanitized buffer overflow, but since 2017, there have been a lot of modules that are easy to implement to go ahead and make sure buffer overflow is less likely to happen. So we haven't been able to find many of those since. Passing it to you, Ennis. Thank you. Um, so you may have noticed on the title slide and on this slide, we keep throwing this nebulous acronym at you, IMS. So what I'd like to talk about in the next few slides is what exactly IMS is. Um, what is this thing that we've studied? So the incident management system hence for shortened IMS, is a piece of in-house software, a web application that UMBC's DOIT department developed. And the basic idea behind this web application is fairly simple. UMBC has a lot of people, right? So this is about 40,000 users, I think, during a semester of um, in various capacities on the UMBC network. And this invariably leads to security incidents. So this tool specifically is designed to track security incidents on UMBC. And these can be incidents as benign as somebody, you know, had getting their account password compromised to some physical actual attack on campus, right? But the idea is we're going to have these tickets. Uh, could you go back for a second, please? Um, the idea is you're going to have these tickets people put in here, and there's going to be a nice list of them. You can search for them in a search box, and this system divides users into several different roles. Uh, the screenshot here has the role of security student. We'll talk a little bit more about the roles when we get to vulnerabilities and recommendations, um, but fairly simple web application developed in-house, sort of the perfect thing to analyze, right? So when you click on one of these tickets, one of these titles in the list below, if we could advance to the next slide, please. 
you get this nice breakdown. So what you would normally see is the thing on the right. So for each ticket, there's a bunch of stuff you can essentially look at. You can look at the basic information, which of which there's an example on the left. So tickets have titles, they have dates of you know when they occurred, dates of when the incident was reported, when it was resolved. It links to an RT ticket. So RT is a ticketing system that UMBC already uses, or it already is in place, and UMBC uses it for tracking security incidents, but also everything else. And RT has a few shortcomings that I'll discuss on the next slide that sort of motivated the creation of it, the incident management system to essentially link to it or sit on top of it. Uh, there's a lot of cool things you can do with these. You can in include involved people and assets, incident types, involved data, potential breach information, additional documents, all sorts of things, juicy things, especially if you're sort of adversarially minded, you may already be interested in some of these categories. Uh, next slide, please. So request tracker is an existing ticketing system at UMBC. The UMBC has been using it since I became a student there 10 years ago. So and presumably before that, even it's been around for ages. Um, the problem with RT for security incidents is that it's not able to capture sufficient detail for an incident. So as we saw in the previous slide, there might be other things we want to capture. We might want to link to, to a bunch of users, for example. So IMS is going to link to RT tickets that already exist and supplement the information for those tickets. Basically, it's going to make RT more powerful. The cool thing about IMS versus anything else we've analyzed is that um, it wasn't made 10 years ago. It wasn't made five years ago. It's currently under development. So DOIT is working on this piece of software right now in 2020 and 2021. And we even have SFS scholars who have taken part in some of these previous studies working directly on this piece of software. So this one ought to be good, right? And it's a web application. It follows the sort of classic LAMP stack architecture. Now, LAMP stack has nothing to do with lighting. It is stand, It stands for the sort of for the four horsemen of software on, on a typical Linux machine for hosting web server, which is going to be you, know, you have your Linux operating system. You have your Apache web server. So this is the thing that you actually make web requests to with a browser and it sends you back pages. You have a SQL server, typically MySQL, sitting in the background that the web application is going to query. And it's going to query it how? By using PHP. So PHP is the backend language for this, for this particular web application. This is extremely classic. So we we figured this one out, right? Like most of the web applications in the world run run on LAMP stack. Next slide, please. So when we analyzed this guy, we pretty much had a perfect carbon copy of the system. But I I will emphasize the term copy. So we did not test or try to attack you know the real system. Instead, we received this carbon copy of the system that came with its own LAMP stack. You know. And it's nice Apache, MariaDB, which is a MySQL implementation, PHP, and so forth. And we, so if you, if I can direct your attention to the left of this diagram. So we come in through the VPN. So during our study, we did the study remotely, right? Social distancing. So we all connecting through UMBC's Global Protect VPN service. And through that, we can reach a number of things on a private network. So we can, for instance, reach toby2.comsec.umbc.edu. Toby2 is our victim here. We're, we're the... We're taking the role of the adversaries in the study. We can also reach a second machine, temp.gl.umbc.edu. This is a secondary machine sitting on the same network as Toby2, so inside of this box, fortunately for us. And then Toby2 interfaces with two other systems at UMBC, Shibboleth, which is a authentication system out of the scope of our study, but essentially it handles you know checking who you are when you sign in. And then we have an LDAP server, which basically is a public I'm told a public directory of, of student information at UMBC, which Toby2 queries when you do things like add users to events and stuff like that. So not too complicated of an architecture, but a few things going on. We can move on. So why do we care about security of web applications? Well, let's talk about that on the next slide here. Web applications are one of the most deployed pieces of software in the world. We're pretty much right now using multiple web applications to make this talk happen. So this PowerPoint is being you know, looked at on a web application, presumably Google Slides. And then we're looking at it on WebEx, which is also in its own way a web application, right? So we're constantly using web applications. And because of the sheer volume of these things, it's no surprise that 43% of the breaches in 2020 were involved in web applications directly. The most common issue is cross-site scripting, dreaded cross-site scripting. Um, we'll see if this application is vulnerable to that. 
And SQL injection attacks are also extremely common, but fortunately less common than they used to be, given how devastating they are. And it seems each organization has to spend about $2.27 million annually, according to Accenture, if you believe those guys, dealing directly with web-based attacks. So we care about web applications being secure because web applications are a primary target for adversaries. They're under constant attack, essentially. I hope I convinced you. Um, next slide. So we had some parameters when we did this. We tried to sort of put our adversary hats on and, and come at this from a certain angle. Some of that was motivated by our own initiative. Some of that was motivated by lack of communication with our sponsors, but we'll talk about that on the next slide. So unlike previous studies where we had white box testing. So in previous studies, we were handed source code you know, full access to the system, all that stuff right away. This time we did gray box testing. So what I mean by gray box testing is that unlike in a white box environment, we had some limitations. We, did, for instance, did not receive the source code for the system. We also did not immediately have root privilege access to the system. So what we had were user level accounts and we essentially had access to one or two admin level accounts, which we never really used the privileges for. And we'll get into why we never needed to do that. So we had some knowledge of the admin level privileges. We had a rough system diagram that we drew, which you saw, you know, previously. We had a DNS system entry for the system, so we, you know, could reach it via a nice little URL. And we really looked at this from a user level angle. So we said, hey, if we're a malicious user, what can we do to this application? So basically, if we have access to this thing in any capacity, what can we do to it? So this is the angle we took. And you'll see what the results of that were in the vulnerabilities and recommendations. But it's a, it's a departure from how we normally do things. And I think it actually prompted us to, to work a bit differently. And may, maybe it was better. So it's a discussion, certainly, if we should go this route going forward. But the truth was, we just didn't think to ask for the source code until Wednesday because we had such a ball with the system. But we'll see why. Uh, on the next slide, I'll talk about the adversarial model a little bit more. So we did restrict ourselves in some other ways. Namely, we said you have to have access to the system. If you can't access Toby2, aka IMS, can't do anything to it. So we assume the attacker has some degree of access to the system, and we assume the attacker has access to you know, some UMBC authorized account. So something that Shibboleth will authenticate that can then access the web, the web application. The interesting thing is the adversary needs nothing more than that to achieve what we were able to achieve. As long as the adversary can reach the web page in any form, you know, even if the web page says they don't have permissions to view it, that is also sufficient. They can do things. And they, oh boy, can they do things. Okay, so that about summarizes sort of what I was going to talk about here. So we're going to get right into the juicy part of this where we talk about what we actually found and what recommendations we made to DOIT as a result. All right, uh, I just want to make sure you can hear me because I was having some trouble with WebEx. I didn't realize it minimized itself to the bottom when you were presenting. We can hear you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's talk about some of those juicy things you can do with just access. Uh, so the first is that uh, when Apache served uh, any of the PHP pages, and therefore the functions on those pages, what it would do to have you as a requester file any of the button clicks or anything is the server side wasn't handling the requests. Instead, the server was telling you what requests to make to it so that it would give you the data you were looking for. So if instead of going to the admin PHP page and clicking and, and doing what you were supposed to do, you simply had a cookie from Shibboleth that said, hey, you're allowed to request from this server, uh, you could send a crafted post request to the page slash admin.php and escalate any user to admin level. Additionally, should the user exist in LDAP, you could give them that account from scratch. Uh, and I just want to make sure that I'm reading everything properly on the next slide before I, I move on. Which means that if you ha don't have access to the page at all, but you do have a Shibboleth account and you can navigate to the server, so you have access to the server from a navigation point of view, and you have an account with Shibboleth, so you, you do have access to have a cookie, which all UMBC users that have access to the server would, uh, then you can 
make this request and make yourself admin on this device um, and in this system. So uh, IMS, one of its critical functions that we discussed in the study that could, it could be used for uh, were, was that if there's some sort of security campaign, for example, an insider threat, you can't really monitor or address an insider threat problem without using a system like IMS to coalesce a series of tickets into a campaign that identifies that insider threat. But if there is an insider, then they have access to the system in the shibboleth manner, and they can become admin and completely undo that campaign. So the only way in which you would be able to identify an insider threat without an, an independent investigation would be to use this system, which is vulnerable to that same insider. Uh, and so we, yeah, <laughs> uh, and and our recommendations in that regard were to make sure that not only were you authenticated by the cookie that you had from Shibboleth, but that only certain cookies were allowed to be at the administrative level. And so, of course, they did have uh, a cookie level authentication to make the request in the first place, but that was not extended to the roles in those requests. Uh, and there was no verification that, oh, you have to be in the admin list to be able to use an admin cookie to be able to access this page. Um, and to some degree, that's not something that would necessarily occur to, to fixing, um, but when you put it up to a group who's pen testing, it's something that becomes alarmingly obvious alarmingly quickly. And so that was the first major vulnerability we um, determined, but this doesn't necessarily give you access to beyond the service, right? This breaks the application, but it doesn't let you get to the system and begin attacking the system. But the second vulnerability that we found does, um, which is the fact that there is on this server a user writable directory. And it's not nat it's not so obvious how you get to it. So whenever you uploaded a whenever you could modify data on a ticket, for example, you could apply additional information, you could upload files, you could uh, store data that uh, you could upload a CSV which would populate one of the databases in there. The way that would be done was through this file upload um, for the last one. The others, when you uploaded a file, that was kept server side, you didn't have access to it. Um, but when you uploaded a CSV that would be read by the system, we found by accidentally uploading the wrong type of file, uh, an executable.zip that was absolutely massive, uh, that it just reads it as though it's a CSV, no matter what it is. And it reads it row by row, and it makes requests on each line. And these requests takes time. So for whatever time you begin to upload this to whenever it ends, this file is on the system. Not only is it on the system, at the end the file is deleted by the service. Uh, and let's see if I can, perfect, yeah. So uh, what we found was that not only were those all true, but that you could also access the directory that these were being stored in. And it turned out to be in this directory called user files. So if you went to toby2 dot, whatever the extension stuff is, slash user files slash whatever you uploaded, then you could navigate to that page and cause it to execute. Uh, so we managed to craft a payload that was a simple script that wrote also into that directory because the Apache user could read and serve from that directory another PHP script called payload.php uh, that gave us access to a shell on the device. And so to go over that one more time, but slower with more detail, um, we crafted first a PHP script that would write another PHP script to the same directory. That first PHP script was simply the program that would write, followed by a number of, if you look at on here, um, bullet point two, um, comments, PHP comments, with comma separated variables at the end. So that it would take time for the parser that you upload to parse and request each of those things. Therefore, we would have a period of delay between when we uploaded it and when the service deleted it. That wrote the second program whenever you requested that page because the Apache user had that ability. And the second program that we wrote was this payload.php, which gave us shell access to the system, uh, which included everything from ls to cat etsy password to, um, or etsy shadow, 
to anything that the Apache user could do, you could do. Um, but of course, this was not a root user, so we did not manage to root the system from there. Uh, and of course, the recommendations here, there are quite a few. Um, none of them are so easy. Uh, the reason why this, this vulnerability exists is because to have a file that you upload be read, it, the Apache user needs to be able to read it. Um, there, the kind of easiest way to fix this is to say you can't serve files from this directory, but the Apache user still needs to read it. So that may fix the problem temporarily, but there may be another way to get the Apache user to serve you that information, given another vulnerability. The more permanent solutions are not saving the file at all. Just keep it in RAM. Don't ever save it. But then keeping it in RAM can slow down that thread that you're accessing, and it can make the process fairly slow. The other is to um, extract the data from the CSV as it comes over the wire. Again, that can be slow. Uh, the best option is the one we last recommended, which is to have the client pre-process the data. And so the client would then serve a series of username, password, and so on, so that, that you don't have to send the CSV over in the first place. And there are a lot of modules that enable you to do this. And I think the last one, no, there are two more that I'll be taking here uh, of the high impact vulnerabilities. Um, this is in line with the user directory and with the um, API exposing. It's just that the, the cookie validation was incomplete. Um, so they would verify that you had an account with Shibboleth that would give you access and that you did have access to the system, but it, it didn't enforce the access control list that the system implied. And so while you weren't directly given the ability to see the admin page without being on the admin list, you could certainly access the admin page. Uh, we found that first because when you tried to access the admin page from a user account, it would redirect you, but you would hit the page at first. And so that kind of let us know that something was wrong here. And we took that thread and pulled and pulled and pulled until we found that we had full access to the API. Uh, the next thing is credentials and source. Uh, and this is the last thing I'll be covering. As always, it seems there were credentials in source code. Um, there is a, a very good reason in this case why they did that. And that's because the Apache user itself had access to the database, the MariaDB or MySQL database, MariaDB in this case, that it was accessing from. And the Apache user does need to know these credentials. And oftentimes the PHP script needs to have these as well. Something you can do instead of storing it in code, though, is to store it as either an environment variable that executes at run, which might be a good way to do it, but a problem of that is that the Apache user can uh, also read that environment variable. So if you break the Apache user, once again, you get these credentials. But more importantly, you can actually store these in uh, as hash form and just treat them in hash form and salt them. And that's not always the easiest to implement, especially depending on the application but it does give you the most, they're the highest degree of long-term persistence. And if any one of those components breaks, you don't necessarily lose the password. Though if the password's gibberish, that doesn't exactly matter. Um, and therefore you don't lose the database or any future databases as well. So I'm gonna pass this back to uh, Ennis for the uh, more um, policy and systemic problem oriented situations that weren't unique necessarily to this exact uh, application. So it's been a long time since I last spoke. So no doubt some of you have forgotten that I said cross-site scripting, although otherwise known as XSS attacks, are the most commonly detected vulnerabilities in web applications. And to defend a statement by to defend a statement I made earlier, every single application that the SFS cohort has ever analyzed is vulnerable to this. For instance, let's take a look at this screenshot. So this screenshot is listing external services involved in the incident. So we have the service named A, and the URL for that service is a picture of a cat with a rainbow coming out of it and a Pop-Tart taking the place of its body. The reason this picture is here is because instead of a URL, what we've provided to this web service is HTML. So we basically said, hey, render this image. And the server turns around and it renders that image. So cross-site scripting is an issue because basically the server is going to now serve to anyone that looks at this page, whatever script we put into the URL, essentially, for that external service. It's, it's a very easy problem to have in a web application, and it comes down to the one simple aspect. You have to validate 
everything users provide you. If there's any entry point into your application where a user can give you anything, you better make sure it matches the form that you expect. For instance, we know what a URL is supposed to look like. It should probably look something like www.thisisaurl.com or something like that. So there's a certain form a URL takes. HTML is not one of them. JavaScript is not one of them. So this is one of the fields they forgot to sanitize. Subsequently, you could do a bunch of stuff here, including putting a cat picture in, but you can do much worse. You can put in JavaScript. You can actually have, you know, login forms and all kinds of other stuff. So it's just a bad practice to allow cross-site scripting to be possible in any web servers. Let's move on to the next slide. So I talked about the inadequate sanitization that really allows adversaries to do this. Um, and sc the scripts can certainly be malicious. They're not always pictures of cats, right? I mean, these can be things that do phishing. They can be things that steal your cookies, execute clickjacking attacks, a bunch. There's sort of a usual bunch when you have these kinds of scripts, right? And uh, a privileged user that views the event. So we have people with privileges looking at these, right? There are people certainly with, with admin level privileges on your MVC systems using the system to look at tickets. And, and they can inadvertently execute these scripts by looking at, you know, a service URL, basically, that feeds them a script of some sort. So just don't let users do this. If you don't take my word for it, OWASP is an authority on the subject, so you can take their word for it. There's a nice link there for you. We can move on from cross-site scripting. But it is my favorite thing to talk about, apparently, because I talk about it every year multiple times. So physical infrastructure enumeration is kind of an interesting idea. So the so UMBC as a campus is quite large. It has a lot of security things on it, right? Uh, among those security things are hundreds of cameras. So there's a lot of, like, it's sort of big brothers watching when you're on UMBC campus, right? But just, as far as I know, we as the students haven't complained yet. They have this nice form where you can select cameras that are related to security incidents. And in this form, there's this beautiful dropdown that lists the name of every single camera on campus. So there are all several hundred of them. And the cameras are nicely named. I mean, they're named pretty much based on where they are. So as an adversary, if you get your hands on this PHP file, which you will, by the way, because again, as aforementioned, we found a vulnerability where we can get Apache level access to the machine, which means we stole all the source code, right? So we got our hands on this nice file here, formcameras.php, and it enumerates every single camera on campus. So as an adversary, if our interest is doing something on campus, you know, physically, we have a good sense of where every single camera is. So let's ask ourselves some questions. Should the source code contain this kind of information? Well, source code leaks. So anything you put in the source code will eventually become the property of the adversary. So I don't think we should give the adversary the locations of every single camera on campus. And certainly when you have source code, you have also, if you're doing things correctly, you have ver some version control system, right? That's protecting your source code. Some place where you can check in changes, you know, check out source code, make sure that a bunch of people working on the project together don't clobber it and that the source code doesn't mysteriously go missing suddenly. Certainly the camera data shouldn't be in the version control system either because people who are not authorized to normally look at the source code might be able to see the comp, like, the details in the version control system, right? Uh, deltas to files, that sort of thing. Our recommendation, move this camera information to a database or to a separate configuration file that you don't check in into a version control system. Don't give the adversary anything if you can help it. Certainly don't give them the location of every single camera in your organization. We can move on to the next slide. So I harp on about potential SQL injection pretty much every time we have one of these talks. This application was quite good about it, but it was not perfect. So basically, whenever you have SQL injection, it happens because you do something like this. So if I could, this here being the snippet of code in front of you. So I'd like to direct your attention to the query. So there's a SQL query that's happening here, sort of on the fourth line, right underneath the second comment. Uh, it's a fifth line, isn't it? Okay. It's a select admin from authorization where campus ID equals, and let's put in whatever string ID is, right? And this works fine as long as ID is a campus ID. But we're getting, like, if you look above, the variable ID comes from the environmental variable UMBC campus ID. Now, an adversary that has compromised the application can change environmental variables, which means we can change the, you know, the value of ID to be a... SQL injection string, something that terminates that query early and inserts another query or several afterwards. So you can never, ever, ever insert a string into a query like this without at the very least sanitizing the string, but we have, we have a much better way to do it. 
which is standard in every language, uh, on the next slide, which is used to sort of prepare bind execute paradigm, right? So if you look at the green highlighted functions, basically when you do it this way, you're not injecting a string into a query. What's it, what it's doing is it's pre-processing the query, which guarantees that the parameter you pass to it will not be executed as part of the query. This shuts down SQL injection cold. If you, somebody does this, you pretty much are going to need some brilliant zero day on whatever, uh, pretty much on whatever framework they're using. Because typically this, you know, this is a paradigm that, that doesn't allow you to execute malicious strings as part of queries. So it's a good way to stop this. In spite of this being available since I think the early 2000s and pretty much every language used for web development, it frequently gets underused. Now, the cool thing is this snippet of code is from the same application. So in some places they do it like this, in some places they do it like they do it in the previous slide. So the recommendation is follow your good practices 100% of the time, not 50% of the time. Speaking of good practices, if we go to the next slide, I really hate copy and paste programming. So you need to repeat functionality somewhere else in your code base. You have a few options here. One option is you can copy and paste the code over and over, which is what we see for this snippet here. So this snippet here I found 30 something times in the code base. And, and this is the snippet from the SQL injection example, right? So great, you have, to, you have to fix this problem. Oh God, this is vulnerable to SQL injection. Now we have to fix it in 30 different places in the code base. We have to make sure we find every single place this code is and fix it accordingly. And if we miss a single place, we still have a vulnerability. So this is why you don't do copy and paste programming. It's actually bad for security. Not only is it a bad coding practice, but it is also bad for security. Because if you code like this, potentially insecure code can linger for a long time because you might miss something. So when we're learning to code, this goes for all of you here studying computer science, we learned that there's this thing called a function, right? It's not exactly like a math function, but you can treat it in a similar way. But functions are really nice. They allow you to make your code modular. If you have to call the same piece of code over and over again, don't copy and paste it, right? A function. Then when somebody tells you a function is insecure, you change that one function and your application is bulletproof afterwards. Well, bulletproof, relatively speaking, right? So don't, don't copy and paste program. This is, this is not a good practice, even, even if it feels like it's a shortcut in the moment. Once you have to change this snippet of code 30 times, you'll regret that you didn't make this a function. Anyways, I'll get off that sort of high horse. Denial of service is sort of a classic tradition in SFS studies, and I'm not convinced it's to harm the application as much as it is to haze the students analyzing the application. Needless to say, this application was surprisingly resilient to our denial of service expert, Maxim Aaron, who has without fail every year managed to crash the thing we're analyzing at least once. He was not able to crash the system, which I think gives it some sort of mark of honor. So that we go back to this file uploading issue. So if you recall the user accessible directories that Cyrus talked about, you can basically upload anything you want, right? To, is a, so it's looking for a CSV file that's gonna have usernames and emails. You can give it anything you want for that. And the issue is for every single line in the file, so whatever you hand it, it's going to make an LDAP request to see if that user exists. And it's going to make several SQL queries as well. So that means each line processes slowly. This is actually a crucial part to why that attack works. So the fun thing is if we start dumping a bunch of huge files in the IMS, it doesn't constrain input file size, by the way. You can give it anything. Uh, you can give it a file with tons of lines. And I mean, when I say tons here, I don't mean like thousands. I mean like millions of lines, right? And IMS has to process each and every one of these lines with an LDAP request and several SQL queries. And the line doesn't even have to be ASCII. So there can be weird character sets that, you know, in, in some cases can even crash some of the things it's querying, maybe. We didn't go that far with it, but... Uh, upload big files to the server that are garbage, and the server will begin to feel it quite quickly. So if you want to make IMS stop working, just start giving it garbage to process, which you can freely do as a user because it allows you to do so, right? Uh, recommendation. I think we have recommendations on the next slide for this, or is this sort of a truncated slide? Okay. So recommendation, basically, this is going to sound kind of um, haphazard, maybe, but just don't do this. Like, if you're, like, when you allow people to upload files, there's a bunch of practices you have to follow. The first of being just try to find a way to avoid it if you can, and if you can't avoid it, Make sure that the files they're uploading fall within a certain size and make sure that at the very least you can do some cursor checks to see if those files actually match the format you're expecting. Ergo, do they even use the character set you're expecting, right? Are they like UTF-8 files or are they binary files? So we got to check this stuff. And um, I, If I could jump in, I think the, the biggest recommendation, if you are writing a web application that handles uploads, 
make sure you do as much client side processing as possible and make sure that the client is able to tell you with some degree of verification that this is what you expect it to be um, because that will mitigate a lot of these problems if not almost all of them you can't necessarily trust that the headers of a file resemble its contents because those can be manipulated at a, at a byte level uh, but if the client is sending you data and you're validating that data as you receive it and that data is the contents of the file for example as a csv then you don't need to worry about what the header of the file looks like in the first place especially because csvs don't have headers uh, by contrast if you're trying to receive a picture from them then you can go ahead and do some deeper level of verification than just that uh, and this i'll pass it back to you to, to initiate the kind part of the conclusion well, I actually love this talk of client-side processing. So if you can't motivate yourself to do more client-side processing for security reasons, perhaps the greed in your heart will pick up on the idea. So some years ago, people discovered, hey, we can save a lot of money on server costs if we just make the client do more stuff. So if you notice that websites are running slow in your browser, it might just be because they're making you do most of the work on your machine with your hardware. So client-side processing is kind of a fun thing that a lot of people are really getting into now. Um, not always for reasons that we would consider benevolent to us as the end users, but that's neither here nor there. So let's talk about this conclusion a little bit. Conclusion, oh, that means we're almost done. I'm sure many of you will be very sad about this. So it would be unfair to just flagellate the system without talking about things it does well. The system was somewhat unique in an oddball out in the last five analyses we've done. And part of the reason for that was because some of the students that worked on this learned from our previous studies, which is fantastic. So the lab stack was configured very well, which basically meant it created this little box that we couldn't break out of. And believe me, we tried. So it restricted our lateral motion, which means we couldn't get further into UMBC systems by breaking this system, at least not at our skill level. You know, there is an adversary out there that would have absolutely torn, torn this thing to pieces, but we're, alas, humble as of us scholars. Um, so, so we were not able to do so in the, in the one week or so that we studied the system. It also was very, very, so one aspect of this is there wasn't a bunch of garbage running on this thing that was vulnerable, right? The system ran basically only what it needed to run to be able to serve the web application, the IMS application to the users, right? And that's good in security. So this is sort of kind of like the least access principle. Like just if, if the machine doesn't need to do it, don't have it do it because every potential point, you know, the, the more textured the machine is, the more things there are to sort of run your hand along and feel, the more places you might find vulnerabilities. A default configuration of the services prevented privilege escalation. Like we actually had the Apache server running on an Apache specific user. A lot of people like running Apache as root. If you do that and you have a web application like this, we root your machine and then from there we probably get into your network and then we hang out there for like 10 years. You know, this tends to be what happens these days. So just don't let it happen. Sanitization was done everywhere. So we couldn't find many practical SQL at injection attacks. Because the one I showed you back there, we didn't really find a way to make that practical. But and the reason for this is, was there was very defensive coding done in a ton of places, you know, copy and paste it over and over again. with a nice little control V. But they did have a nice function that they did that they used for that. So input sanitization, basically all this means is when the user gives you something, make sure that it's not garbage and it's not going to break your system. You have to check everything users give you. Users are at best dumb, at worst outright malicious. So you have to make sure that what they give you is not going to break your application, right? And uh, firewall rules and application controls were enforced. So we couldn't, we couldn't, for example, establish a reverse shell. So we had this sort of limited dinky shell in our payload, which did the trick, but you know, we wanted more, and we didn't get it. But this application crucially improved on things that previous things we analyzed were weak on, specifically SQL injection. Um, it still had cross-site scripting issues. In spite, so in spite of spamming input validation everywhere, they missed a form field or two. And I suspect this has a lot to do with how disorganized the code base is, which has everything to do with hitting Control V too many times in this project, right? So we, we've given we, the recommendations that we've given. I think will help with these issues. But uh, overall, it was interesting. It's the first time we've analyzed something that our own student, that our own sort of cohort wrote in some sense, you know. And I hope we get the chance to do it again, because I think it was very helpful for us. It was very helpful for them. Um, DOIT has been awesome working with us for these five years, just giving us software after software to break. And every piece of software has been extremely interesting and fun to work with, right? But there's some bad stuff, too. Indeed, there is. Um, we've mentioned a lot of what's bad. Um, but I think 
some of the stuff that we haven't mentioned that is also critical and definitely worth mentioning is that because this system uh, gathers data on incidents from tickets that are secured by RT relatively, uh, there's a lot of PII, in other words, personally identifying information, and FERPA, which is the Family and Something Act that governs uh, student data on this system. And uh, all the database components of this system were running on the same box. Initially, we thought that the Apache server was on Toby2 and the MariaDB server was somewhere else, but we found out that they, are, that they were on the same machine. Um, in general, when you're handling sensitive data, that's a very bad idea because while we weren't able to root Apache or break into the MariaDB database, we could have potentially rooted Apache and we could have potentially broken into the system. And had we have done that, we wouldn't need the credentials for the database to be able to breed into it. The thing that should be done is that database should be residing on another box so that the only way that you can hack it is by breaking into that other box. Uh, just again, a lot of that commingling of services that we talked about earlier that they didn't do for the most part, which was good to see. Uh, this was one instance where on a normal system, you can put a LAMP stack and you can put the data from the website in there. On a system where you have uh, sensitive data, you're going to want that database on a different server. And that was not the case with IMS. Additionally, and I think this correlates heavily with the copy paste uh, mentality, is there's a lot that was brewed in house. Um, so much so that some of the functions when we were reading over them, we were thinking, isn't there a module for this? Didn't we, when we were reading the documentation on Shibboleth, see a way PHP interacts with Shibboleth natively? And they were manually using that, or writing that code to do that interaction. Um, not only does that alleviate on the time it takes for you to write code, which is something you always want to uh, minimize, but it also makes sure that the code that you write is being moderated for not only efficiency, but also security by some third party. So not only does it alleviate the work you have to do, it also alleviates the work you have to do. Uh, so open source libraries should be used whenever possible. Uh, that's a generally true statement for any project, uh, even projects that uh, might be made slightly more efficient by you writing the code yourself. There are a lot of considerations that you're not necessarily able to account for that are probably explained by why that program that was worked on by many people as opposed to just you is slower than the program you might write. Um, which is to say, be humble when you code, but also use open source libraries whenever you can. And finally, and, and I left it to here to talk about it rather than mentioning it on the user directory side, even though it was on there. We have one service that's handling everything and Apache is powerful and it has a lot of modules that you can use and that's wonderful, but Apache is in and of itself one service. And just like you want to separate the data sense, the sensitive data from the system that is doing Apache, you want to separate the tasks that are being done by Apache into other services if possible. That includes especially file upload and SQL queries. Um, or even the PHP service in rare cases can be handed off and the Apache can simply be used to hand you off to multiple PHP services, something like a load balancing system. Um, and, and by doing so, you not only increase security, you reduce the potential to be DOSed, which is nice. Um, that's denial of service. And you, of course, uh, make it easier to make changes, uh, which is, again, nice. And finally, the ugly. Um, for once, I think we can safely say there was nothing about this application that was spectacularly ugly. Uh, I think back to Verthost, my first year working on these studies, when we had access to all the Kerberos identifiers and things to create Kerberos tickets on the box, neatly available, readable. That was ugly. Or last year with Sam's, there was uh, quite a bit that was ugly, but nothing that was too glaringly horrible. Um, uh, now I'm thinking of like four things, so I'm just going to skip mentioning any of them. Uh, but this year, IMS, and, and as Anna said, I think a large part of this is due to the fact that we had former members of these studies writing this program. And that led to the just large glaring vulnerabilities weren't present, which was really nice to see. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, do you have any questions? You can raise hand. I, I think I know how to use WebEx a little more now in the last 10 seconds. Yeah, you can raise hands. If you have a question. Well, don't everyone clamor at once. 
Um, what advice do you have for um, students who want to participate in future studies concerning how they can um, prepare to be more effective when the study takes place? That is a fantastic question. I think one thing that, we're, that we as a study are going to be doing that worked very well this year um, was in the first day we spent time working with the cyber dogs to teach a small lesson on how to use Metasploit and how to use uh, how to attack a Metasploitable system. And Metasploit is a common toolkit for breaking into these kinds of systems. Uh, it has helped us in years past. It did not help us so much this year because the system was not vulnerable to any of those attacks. But most importantly, it engaged a lot of people who were slightly newer, especially to the study. I'm thinking right off the top of my head, just looking at this list, uh, David Williams uh, was amaz amazingly contributive, uh, and I'm not sure if he had been around in the previous years. I'm sorry if you have, and I'm just calling you out and not knowing. Uh, but I think that that lesson definitely gave a lot of people access to information they otherwise wouldn't have had. And so uh, that said, if you're interested in this kind of research and this kind of activities, uh, definitely reach out to CyberDogs. Um, they are an amazing organization and take uh, Dr. Nicholas's class, um, Chris S. Is that Chris Gain? There we go. Uh, yeah. Uh, so if you want to talk a little bit about what CyberDogs has to offer. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so brief introduction, I am the present, uh, current president for the uh, CyberDogs Club for this year, uh, this school year, academic year. Um, so in the fall, we tend to... Um, so we we go over a variety of topics leading up to one of our um, our own hosted events, uh, a cyber defense exercise, which is a red team blue team event. Um, for kind of it's meant to be an introduction for beginners, but basically what most of what we do is we go over um, some like some light sys administration stuff um, in the sense of uh, firewalls, uh, like incident response of uh, like where you look for when something went wrong, what you do when it's something went wrong, um, like data collection of sorts, um, both on like the Linux and Windows side. Um, so it's that's kind of a rough introduction to like more, it's it's more defensive focus just because the the event we have um, is modeled after a CCDC, which um, is, uh, is the Casey, Casey O'Brien here as the uh, MACCDC? Um, yes, I am. Yeah. Um, so he, he runs the Mid-Atlantic CCDC. Um, there's a national one, but we, we model our event after uh, those events in which the participants are playing as the defensive blue teamers. Um, so we're the fall is heavily defensive focused. Um, and then to not rant on too long, uh, in the spring, as we we're starting up next week uh, on Wednesdays, uh, we're going into some more advanced topics, which tend to be more red team focused. Um, so if anyone's interested in that um, sort of thing, uh, our uh, website, I can put, I can post the uh, club website in the chat for everyone to visit. There's a calendar with all the meetings and the topics. Um, and, um, those will be fun. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I think it's about rough. Is that a good enough introduction, Cyrus, you think? Yeah, absolutely. That was phenomenal. Thank you so much for jumping on like that. Uh, Casey had a question. Um, this year for the first time, the event was conducted entirely remotely. So can you comment about, um, what, uh, impact that had on the study? I have my opinions, but I think Ennis has his, and I'm not sure if they directly align. So I'm going to let Ennis take this question first. And if, if I vastly disagree, I'll jump on at the end. Can you restate the question, please? I just want to make sure I answer the right thing. Yeah. Uh, it, let's see. Um, I'm just curious, what were some of the challenges with the study, given that it was virtual this year? Um, geez. You know, like in many ways, the study was easier because it was virtual. So... You could turn around and say, what are the challenges of like an in-person study? Um, certainly it's harder to engage with people if if you're sort of separated from them by the veil of the internet, right? 
And technical issues are harder to resolve because you can't look over somebody's shoulder and see what they're doing. Although with screen sharing, I suppose there's a degree of that. Um, but certainly it's harder to engage students that are having trouble, for instance, getting valid UMBC accounts to even access the VPN to work with us, right? Because in the past we've had um, ways of dealing with this. Uh, it's easy, I think, for people to get disengaged and check out, you know. You don't know if somebody's listening when they're connected to a Discord channel without a webcam. Like, they could be away from their computer for most of the day. And I'm almost certain some people were, you know. <laughs> so, so I don't know. Uh, I think the engagement, is it's harder to keep people engaged. But in some ways, it's also easier because we're in a Discord channel together the entire day. And... Um, we have a good record. So Discord keeps a nice record of the chat. So this was our best, well, for two reasons, this was our best documented study ever, right? The first was we had like one of our best note takers of all time. And the second was everything we said is still there. We can go back and look at the channels. We can even search them to, to, see, what, to see what happened. So um, I think engagement is a challenge, but Discord provides a lot of benefits. I foresee that we'll continue using some platform like this even if the studies go back to being in person you know when the pandemic subsides it's just it's a big advantage in some ways i think it's very much two-sided um with engagement um the remote feature made it more um flexible for people to participate they didn't have to drive to umbc they didn't have to necessarily participate all day um from an organizational point of view, I would say it was much easier to go remote. I didn't have to worry about a room reservation. I didn't have to make arrangements for catering for lunch. Um, and um, connecting with outside experts um, in some sense is easier because they can just drop in. They don't have to drive to UMBC. They, they may not be located near the UMBC campus. If, if I can jump in and make a, another statement, um, I think while you do get a higher opportunity for people to check out in larger ways, uh, just literally get up, walk away from the computer and, and check messages every once in a while, um, there's an element of, I felt personally far more aware of the people who were checked out and I was able to reach out to them and make sure things were okay or at least make an effort to do so. On top of that, they weren't necessarily, uh, I, I hate to think of it this way, as the potential that somebody who's checked out can distract other students. But uh, I think that, that we, Ennis and I certainly prioritize team building during these studies. In fact, we even play a game alongside these studies that promotes adversarial thinking. Um, and we encourage people to participate. The people who checked out tend to interrupt those kinds of activities. Uh, and in an online format, that was, that seems to have happened a lot less this year. Uh, it seemed to be a lot more constructive of an environment. Though again, I really don't like to think of people not being engaged as a problem because it doesn't help remedy the issue where we either haven't done our part to help them understand why this is an interesting problem or our part to make sure that they know enough to actually address the interesting problem. Uh, so I don't like to think of it as a problem, but the problems that these situations do create were easily mitigated and seem to be far more obvious and easier to handle. Thanks for that. Appreciate that. Thank you very much, um, Ennis and Cyrus, um, and congratulations to all the participants who did a great job. Um, in two weeks, we have our next CDL meeting. Uh, the guest will be um, a UMBC alumnus, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Carback, who got a PhD in uh, voting with me, and he's going to be talking about um, his experiences uh, where he joined a startup company um, after leaving UMBC, and and things didn't go so well. So it's more of a, a lessons learned experience in what it's like to work in a security startup company. It should be very interesting. So thanks everybody. That that concludes our session. I'll see you in two weeks. Well, thanks.